All right. Make sure this is worked and kicked up. All right. Great. Then we are back here for the continuation of our Code Academy live stream for our quiz app. Welcome back to everyone who is here live watching along with us and hello to people who are tuning in later. Uh, if you wanna catch up with where we've been so far, the link that is in chat right now is a link to the version of the project where we have ended up with last time. So I'll go ahead and link that out here. So if you'd like to follow along by looking at the code, you can feel free to go ahead and follow along with that there. If you'd like instead to follow along by just watching and piecing it together, you're welcome to do that too. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get back into it here. So let's take a look at where we ended up last time and the problem that we were trying to solve. So where we ended up, we had our application in a state like this here. So we built out our initial quiz application. We had built out some of the controls that we could kind of play around with to get to see some of the other options. So we ended our session with that last time. Uh, and we built out some of the basic logic that would let us tell learners of users of our application whether or not they got something right or not as they're working through it. So let's take a quick look at where we ended up. So we have here asking what the first computer bug is. We select, in this case, the mop. We get a green because that's what it is. And then we get a bar showing up here that doesn't do anything. And if we collect, select something that's not the right answer, it turns up red instead. So a great start to our quiz app, uh, but we don't yet have a full game out of this. So what we have so far is a way to showcase individual quiz questions to people who are using our application. But there's a few things that we have missing. As we, saw, as we were just talking about, we'd love to be able to click on this next button and have something show up so that we can transition to the next question, have the text here change to two out of four, have this question update, have all these clear out and have these answer choices update as well. And that's what we're gonna be doing in the session today is figuring out how we can use the concept of a view model, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to build out a more fully featured game that can present multiple different questions. So let's go ahead and get started first with the easy task of making it so that this thing here is at least a button instead of just being a block of text. Now that's pretty easy to do with Swift UI. So let's go ahead into our bottom text. And right now we can see that this is just text. We'd love for this to be a button instead so that we can click on it. We can do that by just adding in a button here. And then we can see that the initializer for button takes in an action and a label. Maybe we don't know what the action is yet, but our label can just be this text that we had made up down here. For our action, we can just say, uh, say print hi. We'll figure out something to do with it. And now we can see that this should build and compile. And then we get a button here. We can see it turning blue instead. Now, it's not gonna do much yet, it's just printing high, and that will only actually happen once we have it hooked up in the simulator as we saw before. But now it's a button and we see that we can click on it. Let's do one other thing with this, and we'll do the same kind of trick that we saw inside the game view. Uh, we had an answer button here, and we had this on-click property, which let us decide we didn't know what we're doing with it yet, and then pass in something new. And hey, the question in chat, uh, Tka, uh, this is uh, Swift actually, which does look very similar to Kotlin. Uh, Swift is used for building iOS applications. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and then add in the on click here. So we can say on click is going to be something that we'll get passed in later. And then we can go ahead and specify that action here. Once we add this as a property, it's gonna tell us anywhere we use this bottom text that we need to specify what we want it to do, just like it's a button. So we can go ahead and fix that here. We'll have, I think, one more place where this is going and we'll go ahead and clear that too. And hello from Uganda, that is exciting. I hope, uh, hope you're ready to learn some iOS development stuff here as we continue adding some features to our game. 
Okay, so now we fix that. We have a place where we can be adding uh, to our bottom text. Now has a little button inside it as well that we can pass some functionality into. Uh, great. So now let's get back to that central question. We have our game. Uh, we can see it inside this tab if we like, but our game doesn't really accomplish anything. We can see one question, which is great, but it can only ask one question. And we really want to have multiple different questions that we can be presenting. A single question isn't actually powerful enough in our game view. We want our game view to be powered not just by one question, but to be powered by an entire game, a whole list of different questions that we can be presenting to the user as they're navigating through it. In order to do that, we're going to want to go ahead and add a game object, another model, which is going to represent all of the questions and set the way that the users can interact with our application. So let's go ahead and do that first. Inside models, we're going to make a new model, which is going to represent the whole game that we're working with. So to make a new file here, you can right click on models, click on new file. We're going to make a Swift file. And then this is going to be our game. So we have a game class that we're building here. Now, what is a game? Well, in this case, it's a list of all of the different questions and figuring out how users can navigate through them and get informed if they're right or wrong. Uh, and hey, the new person late to the broadcast. Good to see you here. We're building out a quiz application for an I for iOS. Oh yeah, and the software for this is Xcode, which you can download on Max. Okay, so on our game, we need to have a list of questions that are available here. So let's go ahead and give our game the questions we're gonna use. Our question that we built out before has this static property, which is all the questions that we're gonna have in our game. So we can go ahead and give our game those questions as its starting questions. And because it might be nice if uh, the game was a little bit different each time, we can just go ahead and shuffle it so that every time the order is a little bit different. So they're presented in a different order, which is the same thing that Academy does on our platform as well. Just we'll shuffle those quizzes, those quiz questions. Okay, so we have the questions that we're marching through, which is good. Now we have some concept of multiple questions. Um, but we still need to have a current question and a way through advancing them. To represent that, what we can do is we can have an index, which we're using to store which question that we're currently on. We want to start at the first question and move through each question until the user is done with it. So we're going to go ahead and make our current question index, which tracks what question are we on right now. We want to start at question zero, because arrays start at zero for, for development. So this is our current question index. And then we can give ourselves a little bit of a convenience property here to say, what's the current question we're on? We could write out anytime we wanted that, like questions at this index. But let's just make a little helper uh, property to give us that here. So that's current question which is going to be the current question index inside of our questions right here. So we're starting to build out our game to capture the information that we need in order to have the questions that we're able to answer in order for the users. Okay, so we have these here, which is a great start. And now the last thing that we're gonna need is a way of advancing our game state. How do we get to the next question? Once the user is ready to see the next question, they've tapped on that next button, we'll need to update our game that that happens. So we're gonna make a method here called advance game state. And this is going to go to the next question. We can do that by just getting uh, the next question. So next question index, which is going to be equal to the current question index plus one, and then assigning that here. And yeah, absolutely. Shuffling uh, makes the questions appear in a random order. So the questions will always be these four questions. You can always add your own questions, uh, but this will make it appear in a shuffled order so that it's not always this question appearing first. It'll appear in a random order each time. 
Okay, so we have our next question index, which is going to be the current question index plus one. And then we want to assign our current question index to be equal to the next question index. When we try to build this, we see that we have an error. This tells us that self is immutable. Well, we all know that in real life, uh, self changes a lot. We change over time. And there's actually a way to mark that inside of Xcode. Now, it expects that unless you specify otherwise, that all of these properties should stay the same. You can tell it, no, it's OK. I know this is going to change by clicking down here and just clicking on the fix option, which tells us that we want to make this function mutable. So now it says that this function, rather, is a mutating function. It can change the state of our application. So that builds now when we have our concept of a game. Now, it's not much of a game, but it's a, it's a game. We have our questions. We have our question index. We know what our current question is, and we can advance a game state. There's one other good concept that we should use here, which is a, the concept of encapsulation. And what that means is when we are developing with our game structure and the rest of our application, we only want to have access to the properties that we need to be using. So for example, we're going to need to call this advanced game state method. So we need to be able to have access to it. But we don't really need to know what the current question index is. That's kind of internal business that this game can deal with by itself. That's kind of private. Like we don't want to get into its inner workings and figure out what its current question index is unless we really need it. So what we can do is we can mark that these are private. And then these are the default, which is internal. You can leave that out because that's kind of the default there. And then what we can also do is just add a little note for ourselves that these are going to be internal methods internal methods and properties, and that these here are private properties, private properties. What this mark does here, aside from making it show up in a neat kind of green way, is as you're looking here, you can see that it kind of breaks out the different sections you have. And if you're using, uh, there's this mini map option here, and you can see that these marks are added really big, so it's really easy to find at a glance. Our files are still pretty short right now, but occasionally you might be working with files that are dozens or well, hundreds or thousands of lines long, and it can, can get really easy to get lost for what's where. So adding these what are called pragma marks can be an easy way to find things that you're looking for. Okay, so now we have our game. Now, how do we work with our game? We could go to our game view and then just start making a game and working with the game directly. However, there's a general design principle when building iOS applications that tells us that that's not such a good idea. And that's called the model view view model question here. Uh, and before getting into that, why is the current question? Oh yeah, quick note on syntax. It's a great question. Uh, this is what's called a computed property. What this means is every time you want to know what the current question is, it runs the code that's in between these curly braces. So this just states what the what kind of thing it is. This is called type annotation in Swift. And then in between here is how it finds the answer to the current question. Um, some languages don't have this. We could have also written something like get current question question as a method like this. This would have done the same thing. But the syntax is a little bit nicer because functions imply that we're doing something or changing thing. And this is just a property. We're just getting it here. So there's lots more you can look at for um, what computed properties look like. Like technically, you write out these get keywords, which show the same thing. We have all of those in our uh, intermediate Swift course if you want to get deeper into them. For now, the important thing to get from it is that it's just a way of accessing the current question. And then this is type annotation to talk about what it is. It's a great question, though. Uh, and the reason why we can't do equals is because it changes over time. If we said current question index with an equal sign, and then this index changed later, our current question would still be stuck in the past. So we have to recompute it each time someone asks for it because the current question index might be different. OK. so. Now that we've gone and built our game out here, we're talking about how to integrate it with the rest of our application. Now, 
the general design principle, which I'll touch on briefly, is called a MVVM architecture, which stands for model, view model, and view. So M V V M, model, view, view model as architecture. The general way that you describe building an application is we have our views, which we can see up here. And our views are all things that users can see, tap on, and work with directly. They're where information gets presented to, to users and where the capture intends from users. Like if they tap on a button or enter text in or take a photo or something. Our models, as we've seen, are where the business logic and data are housed. So this is kind of the business logic, like our questions for application or our core logic about how to advance through the game as we're playing it. Now, how can we relate the game and the game view? If we just put it in directly, our game would be very tightly coupled to what our game view needs. It might have specific things that we need in our iOS application that maybe other people wouldn't need as much. The idea when you're building models is that they should be reusable in lots of different contexts. This question that we've built works great in our iOS application, but it would also work in a command line application. There's no reason why we have to be presenting things visually with this model here. Maybe we wanna build a text-based version of our application. We could still use the same question model. It doesn't use any views. It's not talking about anything that, the, that learners or users of the app can see. So we want our, our, each of our uh, models to be re reusable in a lot of different contexts. But that means we still have to do the work of translating these abstract businessy data concepts into views that we can actually see. While the view could do it itself, it would get really bloated pretty quickly because there's gonna be some logic it needs to take care of. So what we need to do instead is build an intermediate layer called the view model, which is responsible for taking in information from the model and then communicating it to the view. And so this is uh, the new style of architecture that's used for Swift UI. You might also see MVC or model view controller architecture in older applications, but this is a really clean and elegant way to divide out different pieces of your application. So the work our view model does is it gets bound to our view. So as the view model changes, our view is gonna go ahead and update automatically, which is super convenient. And we can keep our model this kind of pure business abstracted layer, which we don't have to worry about bleeding in any sort of view logic into it. It just gets to know what the state is of our game at any given time. Okay, so that's very theoretical. That's kind of like what view models are for. What does that actually look like in practice? Let's go ahead and take a look. We wanna build a new directory here. We have our views, we have our models. Let's build that view models layer where we can be housing those. Uh, we can do that first by making a file, which is going to represent our game view model, which is still just going to be a Swift file, game view model. And we're going to go ahead and give it its own directory here, which is going to be view models. Uh, generally good to not have spaces in your names. It'll work most of the time, but occasionally you might get some weird errors from it. Okay. And then what we could do is we could even reorder these so it matches our MVVM style. So we can have our models. It can also be really hard to like get this in the right spot when you're dragging it. it takes, uh, takes a bit of finesse. Okay, how's that? Almost, almost. All right, so we've got our models, our views and our view models. We can expand those out again. Okay, now what is our game view model gonna do? Well, we know it needs to relate between our uh, game view and between our game model. We're going to make this a class, and we'll see why in a little bit here. The classes are very similar to structures, but there's a key difference we'll get into in a second. So our game view model is going to be our way of relating our game to our view. So the first thing it's going to need is it's going to need a game. So our game view model now has access to this game here. Now our view is not actually gonna have access to a game. So anything that the view needs to do 
it has to go through the view model, it's the gatekeeper to any of the logic that we're interested in. So uh, what does it need to do? Well, we can start figuring that out by going into the game view. And I'm going to open this up side by side. Uh, if you hold down option and then click on a file, it'll open it up uh, side by side next to it, which is pretty neat. And open up our game view here. Well, not going to, nothing's going to look different for a little bit. So we're just going to go ahead and hide that. And now we can see we have our game view over here on the right, and we've got our game view model over here on the left. So we really don't want this to just be a question anymore. Our game view needs to display the whole game. It's not just for displaying a single question. So what we're going to do is something dramatic. We're going to go ahead and delete this question, replace it with a game view model, and then see a lot of different errors that we see. So let's go ahead and take a look. So let's go ahead and make our view model, view model, and make that a game view model. And we can just make a new one with it and get rid of our question entirely. As expected, that seems like it broke a lot of things. So we're gonna go through each of the dependencies we had on a question and give those to our view model instead so it knows how to be displaying information. Uh, and before that, you can make a trick in a question. If they get the right answer, you change the question since it becomes wrong. I love it. Uh, kind of like a, what is that game called? Like the impossible quiz. It was like kind of like a classic web kind of thing. You can absolutely build something like that. If we have time, we can see I could mess around with it at the end. Um, but that's absolutely something you could mess with. And there's lots of neat uh, stateful tricks you can use there. Um, okay, so let's fix some of these bugs. Now, it's important when you're developing to not get scared when there's a bunch of like red errors coming up when you're when you're programming something. That's a that's a normal part of refactoring is you make a change, you see a bunch of errors, and then you work uh, one by one to fix them. In our case, it's uh, the errors are telling us exactly what we need to do, which is why Swift being a compiled language is super helpful. Is because once our code compiles again, we know that we haven't broken anything too obvious, though we still may have introduced some bugs we don't like. So let's go ahead and fix these. We know that we need to get the questions text as the first thing we're displaying. Well, we need to get the question from here. So let's go ahead and get access to that. So we're going to need the uh, to get the question from the game here, from the game view model. So we can go ahead and copy. I would just say this here. So we want, yeah. So we want to go ahead and have the question text. Question text, and this is just a string. Games have a current question and questions have question text. So now instead of having this single question, we're going all the way back to the game through the view model to figure out what the text would be. So here we can replace this with view model dot question text. That build error goes away. And now we can see some more errors that we can be resolving. This is, is trying to figure out all of the indices to know what the for each looks like. We can grab those too. So we can say answer indices. Uh, and the type of this is kind of a range of integers, all of the in indices that can show up. Uh, Game.currentQuestion.possibleAnswers.indices. And now we have all the indices. Now we can replace this string here with view model dot answer indices. Great. Now we need to get the, what should the text be for a particular answer? We can build a little method that'll do just that. So we can call this like answer text or index, which is just gonna give us just the text that we should be showing for each question, uh, for each index. And we can do that by here looking at the current question, dot current question, dot possible answers at whatever the index is. And we can go ahead and replace this here with answer to, uh, view model view model dot answer text for index. And then down here, we're looking at if the guest index was the correct, the question's correct answer index. So now we can just go ahead and make that happen from the game here. So our, we did leave the sugar uncovered, too many bugs, but we're fixing them all. Uh, so we can go ahead and then have our correct answer index. 
which is just a the int, which is the current questions correct answer index. And then we can update this here to be our view model dot correct answer index. And last, now because our game view here doesn't take in a question, it just has a game view model, we don't need to give it what question we're working with. Our game is going to decide that. So we can go ahead and get rid of this from here and from our game view that we build inside of the tab view. Okay, so all those build errors went away. So let's go ahead as the a good first step. Let's see. Let's see if we broke something. That's always that's always exciting. So let's go back to our game view. Go ahead and resume. And great, we can see that it randomized it. So we see a different question now. So that's great. And when we click on something, great, wrong answer shows up as red, and we got that next button, which doesn't do anything yet, but shows up here as we'd want it to. Okay, that's always a good first step of a uh, of a refactor is we want to make sure that we didn't break anything. So so far so good. We can see it shuffling to pick new questions each time we're playing it here, which is exactly what we're looking for. Okay, so now let's go ahead and build that next function in here. Uh, let's go ahead and click on. Uh, making it so that clicking on next actually advances the question. Our game already knows how to advance questions. It finds the next index and then goes and reassigns the current question index to be that. And then all those places where we're talking about the current question will recalculate to find what that answer should be. At least that's the hope. So let's go ahead and build that into the view model so that it knows how to advance questions by giving it a I know, advanced game state advance game state. And this just passes along. Uh, great. So we can see we had an error. Same thing that we saw before. This game we just said was just not supposed to be changing. So we can mark that it's okay for it to change. Okay. And last, let's go ahead and pass in back in the game view. Uh, where is it? Great. So the bottom text here, instead of doing nothing, let's go ahead and make it go to the next question. So view model dot vant game state. Okay. This looks promising. Let's see. Let's see if we got everything hooked up that we need. Okay, we're playing. We click on binary. We click next. Nothing happens. Now we got almost everything hooked up, but there's one really crucial concept. Uh, that we need to be using to make sure things are updating. Remember when before we had the index and we weren't allowed to change it unless it was marked as state? There's something very similar happening here. Just like we need to mark things state so that Swift UI knows to update things when they change. We need to do something like that here. Our view model is definitely changing. Things are things are things are happening. We're clicking on the button. We are advancing our game state, and we can parse that out. We can kind of prove that, so to speak, by using some breakpoints. So it's a good debugging technique. If we go into our game view model, uh, and we could put a breakpoint here, we can just verify that everything's actually connected. Once our simulator pops up, they do take a minute sometimes. Yeah, so these are uh, just clicking on, if you haven't seen breakpoints before, you can go ahead and just click on the line number and that makes this little bookmark show up. And when you have that bookmark show up, it means that whenever your code gets to that line, uh, it just waits there. And then you can kind of poke around and get to see some of the internal state that's happening. So if we sit, answer here and click next, we see that this stops. We, we got to this line. We're really trying to advance a game state, but still nothing's happening. So let's take a look at why that is. Like we mentioned before, when we're using, uh, when we want our views to be updating, things have to be marked as state. Now, we can't mark this as state because it's a little bit complicated. There's there's a whole object here. It's not just a single view that's up, that, that, it's not just a single thing that's updating. It's like this whole game that's updating and might have any number of things that we care about that are updating that change what this looks like. So what Swift did is they introduced a special keyword 
for these objects, which is called a state object. That's the marker we want to have here. And state objects can change, so they need to be variables, changing things and not let constants. Now the problem is that we can only have observable objects as things that we have marked as state objects. The reason for that is because things that are marked as observable object, SwiftUI knows that they can change and knows to update people when they change. So we need to go back into our game view model and mark that it's an observable object. Now we've, this should compile. And this is indicating that from our views perspective, hey, this thing here is stateful. It's going to change. And when it changes, all of these things might need to be redrawn. A new thing has to be shown to the user. A different question, which is the goal of this originally. Um, our game view model then has to be marked as observable object to showcase, yeah, I, can, I know I'm a thing that can be observed. I'm going to change. And the last thing we have to do is mark, what are the things we should be looking for again? And that's by using this published marker. There's other ways of doing this as well, but this published marker says, I am an observable thing. As the game changes, publish those changes to whoever is paying attention. And because this is paying attention and hasn't marked a state object, then it will go and update itself. Let's actually see if that happens first. So we click on play. We get this here. We click on binary. Click resume. That froze. Uh, we click on something. We click on next. And great, the question changed. We see that we have a different question appearing now, and the answers all change. There's a couple of things we're going to need to debug, but we definitely are making the right kind of progress here. So to recap, what 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 happened with this process? We built our view model and we just built it without any special fancy Swift UI markers. And we found that even though the code was running, things weren't hooked up exactly correctly. We clicked the button and nothing happened. The way to fix that is to mark what is a, and this has to be a class because only classes can be an observable object for kind of lower down Swift things. But we have to make our view model a class and that's marked with observable object. And this marked with is called conforming to a protocol. Again, we have lots more on protocols in our intermediate Swift course. And then four things that are marked with observable object, anything that can change that you want to redraw when they change, you have to mark as published. Then we can mark this whole thing as a state object. So great, so this is great progress. We now have the ability to show other questions in our application. As we click on next, we can see that we're rotating through the different questions. Now, there's a few bugs. Uh, anyone can type in chat, what are some of the bugs that we're looking to fix here? What's wrong with this, with, with, with the way that this application works right now? Uh, perfect, question change, but the number of the questions did not change. Totally, that's one thing that is wrong with this. Right, so this says one out of four, we click next, still one out of four. That's not good, that's a bug we have to fix. Uh, what else, what else is wrong with this? It's definitely gotta fix that one out of four thing. But there's something a little weird happening too once we click the next button, right? You can see that we're clicking next. This changes, this stays one out of four but the kind of bottom part looks a little bit out of whack as well. Looks like there's something not happening there that we'd like. So as we click play again, we can see that when we click on one of these options, this is all good. Starts off as green. We have the button showing up as the right colors here. But once we click on next, I didn't click on anything and it just started as the wrong color. It just started filled in and all these buttons we can't click on. That's definitely not the behavior that we're looking for here. So in order to make sure that we're, uh, well, having a real quiz that we can present to people, we need to make sure that we're updating, uh, we're clearing this out and resetting every time we click on something. So let's go ahead and fix those. But first let's take care of the issue that uh, Scott pointed out earlier. 
uh, where we are going to fix this little one out of four thing. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. And yeah, absolutely. We have to change the button color back. Uh, there's a little bit of delay on this, but that's totally right. Uh, okay, so how can we go ahead and do that? Well, let's go ahead and take this one out of four. Oh, we just have this hard coded. So we can go ahead and fix that by going back to our view model. Ooh, getting rid of that. And then say we need to have our kind of like progress text as a concept that might encapsulate that. So we've got our progress text, which is text, which is a string. And our progress text is going to be question something out of something else. Well, we kind of need to know how many questions there are and we don't have access to that yet. We can find that out by going back to the game. And then here, we can start exposing some more properties from the game. So we could say something like the count of the questions. Uh, and we also need to get the current index. A couple different ways we could do that. The easiest way to get the index is just to mark this as private set. Oh, sorry, private set here, which means that we can read this, but we're not allowed to write it from any other context. So that should give us access to it. And then we can do the same thing for the questions just to get to know, but we only really need to know how many there are. So we can actually just grab the question count. That's, that should do it just fine here and just get the questions count like this here. So again, this is just some playing around with some other things we can do with encapsulation. So what can we do from there? Now that we have our question count and our current question, we can go back into our game view model. And we can say that this is not question X, it is question uh, game dot current question index out of, we could say it's out of four, but maybe we add more questions. We wanna have, to, wanna have to remember each time to be adding, to be changing this around as we added more questions. So now we can just grab it from our question count for what the progress text should look like. Okay. Then we can go ahead and build. We can see that that updates, which is great. Let's go ahead and see if we fix that bug before getting into the, the, the real serious one of the, where the resetting is not working. So we stop, we resume, because we made a bunch of model changes. We play. All right, we see first computer bug. And now, hmm, what do we miss? Let's see. So we've got our view model, current question text. Actually, what did we miss? It's an interesting question. Okay, so that still says one out of four and we're expecting it. Oh, well, it's right here. We didn't change our, our view. So we can go ahead then and make sure that our view is reading from our view model correctly. So view model dot progress text. That's why it's always good to make sure that you're testing things as you're developing them because you might not actually be implementing things in the way that you think you are. Again. Very normal process for development is things don't work. How can we fix them? Now this is almost right. We can see that this is zero out of four. Now again, that's because arrays started zero. So we can fix that by just adding one to it inside of our view model, just like so. Now, when we go back to our game view and resumed because we updated our model, our view model rather, now we can see that it has the correct number here. And as we play, we see that it's going to correctly update to the second question. Okay, so solve the first part of that. We fix this, we're reading from the game, we can advance through the questions correctly. Great, let's go ahead and work on the resetting part. Now, there's a lot going on for the resettings and part of the problem is all the resetting code is just owned by the view. It keeps track of our guest index and it figures out what the color is. Now we could try to do some messy things inside our view by like resetting this to nil each time that someone guessed and doing that in the button and then sending it back again. But that's a little bit messy. And that's messy because maybe we wanna have a feature where we could like go back and look at previous questions. Um, voice recognition would be fantastic. Uh, it's, uh, we'll, we'll see if we have time for that at the end. Uh, making no promises, but that'd be fun. Uh, Siri integration. Uh, yeah, so but let's. So the reason we want to have the index not inside of our view is maybe we'll want to keep track of this for later on. So let's go ahead and add that to our game. 
we would love for our game to keep track of the guesses that have been made for each question. Now, how can we do that? Well, inside of our game, we can make a new private property that's representing guesses that have been made. So private bar guesses. And this type is going to be a dictionary where the keys are the, get, are the question and the uh, value is what index they guessed for that particular question. Uh, I believe we have content on dictionaries in our uh, kind of learn Swift course. So if that's a new concept, you should go ahead and read some more on dictionaries there. They're also called maps or hash maps in many other languages. But the idea is we want a way that you give a, a question in and we tell you what the guess index was or if it was nil if no guess was made. So we're gonna want a type that maps a guess to an integer. Now it's gonna complain a little bit and it's complaining because, uh, well, the guess isn't a thing, we want a question. <laughs> it, it's gonna complain because it doesn't know how to have questions be keys. This is a little bit more in depth of how hash maps work. But the basic idea is the things at the beginning have to be hashable, which means you need to find a way to turn a question into a single number so you can go ahead and put it into an array. That's what hashing is. It's a way of turning really complicated things into numbers. Like if you've been following any of the Apple features about uh, detecting inappropriate images on people's phones, there's a lot of talk about the hashing that they're using for it. And that's because hashing is a way of transforming an image into a single number. So then you can do things with that number and compare it or store it. So we can mark that this is hashable. And here it tells us exactly, the compiler is very helpful telling us exactly why this isn't working. Uh, we can do that by just adding this keyword right next to our question. So our question is now hashable. Because this is a fairly simple structure, Swift can figure out on its own yeah, so it, we don't have to worry about it is really, the, is really the beauty of it. Swift is figuring out on its own how to be turning this into a number and storing it. We don't have to worry about the process that it's using to do that. Uh, if our structure was more complicated, we would need to add in a special uh, bit of command like a hash into, hash value and hash into. And we'd have to define these and tell it, hey, how do you turn things into numbers? And here and how do you get the number back from the original thing? But because this is simple enough, Swift will do that for us automatically. And the real in-depth answer is it's it's not just turning a number and storing it. The way hash maps work is that there's like an underlying array or list. We turn it into a number and then we kind of count buckets in the list until we get back to kind of like duck duck go. You're just kind of counting one by one until you get to the spot that it should put it at and then you slot it in there. So lots more on hash maps and on dictionaries on Code Academy platform, but the basic idea is we wanna get a map here uh, and Hashable will let us do that. Uh, so back in our game, we now have a place to be storing our guesses, which is great. Uh, then we can go ahead and give a function so that the user can make a guess and make a guess at an index. We're gonna make it simple and just always, you're only able to guess for current questions. Uh, if there was a different, if we need to go back and change guesses around, we could add that, that functionality later. Uh, so we can go ahead and make our guess at the current question and set it equal to whatever the guest index was right here. Then in our view model, we're gonna to need to have a way to make a guess and to translate that in. Now our game view still has this guest index. We don't want this anymore. The guest index should be only part of our view model and our game model, but it shouldn't be part of our view. We can do the same thing we did before. Let's open up our view model side by side. Let's just get rid of this. And now let's figure out what we needed it for. Okay. So one thing that we needed to do is we just set the guest index here directly. Now that we know our, uh, now that we have this make guess, we can go ahead and add that to our view model. So we'll call this make guess for current question at index. And then this will just go ahead and tell our game to make a guess at the index. 
So we can go ahead and tell our view model to make a guess for the current question index. And it will just go ahead and do that. We also have this thing that we're checking for if the guest index isn't nil. This has always been a little bit clunky. It would be great to have a concept here to have uh, a variable called something like guess was made. Uh, what's the point of guessing? We're gonna guess. Oh, it's a great question. So to clarify, when I'm talking about guesses here, I mean, as a user who taps on a button, that's the act of making a guess. So if we're looking at the application, which I can bring up here, uh, well, this doesn't compile right now, which is slightly unfortunate. Okay, so if I'm looking at this here and then I click on Objective-C, that's making a guess. So they're guessing index zero for this particular question. Or if they're clicking on TypeScript, they're making a guess at index two. There could be a more exact phrase. Naming is always very hard. Maybe like selected answer or choice. Maybe that could be a better name for it. Um, but we've been using the phrase guest to kind of refer to how people are using it, which now that you mentioned it is, is not necessarily assuming the best of users of our application. Uh, so maybe, maybe choice is a much better concept. Let's go ahead and fix it first just to get it compiling. And then we can change the name around because that's an excellent point. Uh, we'd like people to be making choices rather than guesses. They should, they should have some idea of what they're doing, hopefully. But let's go ahead and fix these errors first. So when we talk about guest index or chosen index or selected index, which might be better names for it, we're checking to see if they made a guess or if they made a choice. So we can make a variable to represent that here. We call this something like guess was made. And this is a bool, it's either yes or no. And the answer to it is if the guess at this index isn't nil. Now in our game, we made this private, we can do the same thing here where we can get access to it, but we can't change it. Only the game can actually change the guesses. So then we can go back and ask our game at the guesses. Yeah, selected choice is better. We're actually gonna change that afterwards. I just wanna fix these errors first here. It's a really good point. So we have game.guesses at, what is it, the current question index? Uh, current question index here, or actually, sorry, we actually have a um, guesses is by question. So we have our current question. Do, actually, we don't have a current question. That's it, we just got it from game.questions, which I also don't have. All right, so we need to, to get the current question then so we can be passing it in here. So let's go back to our game. And it's a lot of negotiation. Oh, we do have a current question. Okay, cool. So we can go ahead, I don't know why that wasn't showing up, and take our game.guesses at game.currentQuestion, like so. And then we want to make sure that this isn't nil. Cool. So now we can go ahead and use this guess was made, which is much more descriptive. And to say, it's if a guess was made, then display this. So that's all pretty straightforward. And then the last thing we have to do is take this color for button and figure out how to fix this here. Oh, and of course, these are view model properties. So we just have to add that in. Okay, so then our last step here is we're gonna to wanna to take this color for button and we're gonna to wanna to move it essentially all into the view model. Uh, the view could own this. We could have a way of translating the color back and forth, but it's probably gonna be simpler to just relate it here and have the view model tell us what the color should be. So we're just gonna go ahead and get rid of this from here move this into our view model. Note here that our view model uh, will just have foundation. It's gonna complain because it doesn't know what a color is. So we can do that by importing SwiftUI instead. Uh, SwiftUI, it's a great question. It's just directly from my mind. I, 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 if, if only, I, I have built this out before as a way of preparing for it. It takes a lot of practice before you can build out something fluently here. So. I wouldn't expect anyone really to be ever to kind of have everything in place the first time and just put it together. Usually you have to build something out a few times to get a good sense of it. It's a good question though. Okay, so now we can go here and figure out how to fix this guest index. And this guest index, uh, we can now grab from our guesses here. So we can do the same thing and grab this guess like so. 
And then we just have the correct answer index already here. Great, so now we have our color for button. And then the last thing that we can do is put in that this is a view model and the property instead. Okay, there's a little bit of debate about whether the view model should have Swift UI in it at all. It could still make sense to leave this inside the view. That wouldn't be necessarily wrong. It's just different ways of organizing it. Okay, so everything compiles again, which means this is a good time to see if we broke something. So let's go ahead and put up our canvas here. Resume, let it reload again, and go and play. Okay, so we can see here that as we click on things, we click next, and it clears out. It works. We, oh, hopefully it works. It works. So as we keep clicking on things, we can go ahead and see that our game is updating, and our view model is also updating to reflect these changes now. Because our uh, guesses are stored inside of our game, instead of inside of the view, now this doesn't have to worry about where we are. It's all the game view model's responsibility, which is a great thing to have so that our views can be simple and not have to worry about more than just how do I show information and how do I collect information. Uh, so let's go ahead and make that last change while we're looking at it. I really, and, and you can let me know how you pronounce your name correctly. I believe that was uh, Tiska's suggestion, uh, which if only I could be a wizard, uh, but for how we can go ahead and update uh, the naming convention we're using internally. I agree. I think that guesses is a worse name than maybe selection. I think selection might be a better name. So let's go ahead and open up our global find menu by passing shift command F. That brings this up. And we can see every place in our application where we're using the term guess. Now we can do the simple answer of if we click on this find and put it down to replace, we can just replace guess with selection. We can say match case here, and that will get rid of all the capital ones. Ignoring case will bring in uh, all of them here. So let's go ahead and see. So if we're searching, we want to change all guests to selection. We can see that guesses will change to like selections a little weirdly. So let's go ahead and do this first and change guesses to selections. Uh, let's search on this. And then we can see here, we'll change this to selections. And then we can do the same thing for guess and selection. Then we can go ahead and do the same thing for uh, things that are not capitalized here. So change guess to selection with a capital G and replace these. And I okay. think guessed uh, is going to become selectioned. Uh, which, which, which one where? Um, we have a guest uh, just popped up. It was guest index, I think. So it would be like selection index. Okay. Make selection for current question. That seems OK, right? Uh, was, was there somewhere else that it might have been messy as well? Let's ignore case. Let's, let's We can kind of scan through these. It's always a good thing to yeah. look out for, though. Mm -hmm. Selection, selection. Yeah, the card statement. Ah, selection to index. Love it. Yeah. It should be selected <laughs> index. All right, so we can go ahead and fix that here and call this selected index. That's a great catch, thank you. Okay, so then a selection index. See, find and replace is a powerful tool, but one that you have to be careful with. Uh, but you can see that with a little bit of tweaking there, um, this is a great place to be showing like how kind of code review can work in development environments is there is a suggestion from someone looking at code that we could have a name to make things better. And then we could just use a global find to be figuring out the places we're talking about guesses and, and phrase it instead as selections. And I like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. It's a, it's a concept of a selection rather than a guess at random. So we can always change it back if we don't like it or we want to change something else, but uh, it's, it's good to be, names are, names are hard. Names are always hard when you're, when you're developing. 
So appreciate the suggestion from that there. And let's, uh, as always, go and make sure that we didn't break anything. Okay, click on something. We made a selection. Great. Okay, so great. Okay, perfect. And let's check out the last one. Oh no, something crashed. Well, this has actually always been here. I just, I just wasn't clicking through all the time, but see if you can find out why do we think this crashed right here? What's going on? Why did it crash? But a review kind of, we can see what it looks like in a simulator as well. But the kind of question to all of you is why did this crash? See if we can figure it out. Uh, this is what's called like a runtime error. And so this is pretty bad as a user. Like imagine that this was your phone. And as you are playing this quiz and happily going along and tapping on things, suddenly when you click on this next button, well, this happens here and then your phone just stops or freezes. What happens on real phones is that uh, your phone knows that this is kind of just totally broken and just kills the application. That's a really bad user experience. It's one of the worst things that you can do when you're making an application is have it just hard crash for people because they can't even use it anymore. There's no kind of broken functionality or whatever. So why did this happen? Well, as we can see from running it in a simulator, it actually crashes and tells us what the problem is. And this is why it's always good to occasionally be running things in the simulator instead of just in the preview, because the simulator has a lot more powerful functionality like the breakpoints and being able to go and use other bits of the phone, change settings. And here we can see that it knows where it crashed. And it just highlights that line right here. Uh, yeah, you're totally right. It's because we finished four questions, but we're still trying to go to the next question, right? So if we look here, we can use a little bit of a trick to look at what is the current question index. This PO just stands for printout. And we can see that it's four. Well, what are the indices of our questions? So if we say, what are the questions indices? What are the questions indices? It'll tell us that the upper bound is four, which means it has to be less than four. Four is out of bounds. We only have, having four questions means that we have a question at index zero, index one, index two, and index three. No question index four, that'd be a fifth question. We don't have a fifth question. So we crash. Well, that's not good behavior as we talked about. We can go ahead and fix that by having this advanced game state. And if we've already been through all the questions, we probably shouldn't go to the next question. We should just end the game and have something else that we're doing. We can do that by checking to make sure that this is a valid index here, which is why we wrote this a little bit in a funny way. You might be more used to seeing something like uh, current question index plus plus or current question index plus equals one. We're doing it a little bit more step by step so that we can check to make sure that it's what we want it to be. So here we can ask the question to say, if the questions uh, indices doesn't contain the next question index, or then the game is over. And if it does, then the game continues by going to the next question. So what does it mean here for the game to be over? Well, we could just print that the game is over. Print game over. And let's see what happens now. So as we run our application and we're doing this in the simulator so we can get those print statements, we answer questions, answer questions, oh, and game over. Great. So as we keep tapping, this is just still the game's over. It's not letting us try to advance the next question, not displaying anything else. Advancing game state no longer tries to go to the next question. And you can see how powerful all of the Swift UI binding is, is just with that little bit of publishing, changing this index makes everything change automatically, which is really cool. Did not used to be that uh, straightforward for building iOS applications. So we can end our game here. Uh, and then let's just add a little property here just to represent whether or not the game's over. So I'll just make a uh, game is over, which is a bool. And we can go ahead and then just set that here to be game is over is true. And this should start off as false. And then we don't need to annotate it. 
Okay, so now we're ending the game. It doesn't really do anything. It just kind of tells us that the game's over. It doesn't break anymore, so that's a good sign. So that's as far as we're gonna get to in this session here for our application. We'll do a little bit of recap in a second, but we can see that uh, our game ends and where we're gonna end uh, land off for for next time is saying, hey, we can advance through our quiz, which is fantastic. And we can go ahead and end the game, but nothing happens. So next time what we're gonna look is figuring out how can we transition from this game view to a different type of view entirely so that something happens once the game is over? Uh, okay, so let's do a little bit of recap to figure out how our application is working here and what we added. Uh, so let's see if we can still bring up the side-by-side -side thing. We uh, added in this game structure right here. This is all totally new, and this is our model that's representing how we're playing the game. We have our questions, we have our question index, we can have some properties that we're exposing to our view model so that it can access them. And then the big ways that we're changing it is advancing the game state to go to the next question and making a selection to go ahead and reflect the selection that the user has made. We added that in, we went, and then we added in this whole game view model, which is just, we can see a way to talk from, a way to bridge the gap between the view and the model. The important things to know for our view model is view models all need to be classes. They have to be marked as observable objects so that once they change, uh, they update things that need to be updated. And the thing that is going to be changing has to be marked as published. This means as the game changes and the game changes really just by the current question index changing and the selection changing, it's kind of, that's how the game changes. It's a lot of power from just these two properties right here. Uh, but as these change, then our game goes ahead and updates and it knows because it's marked as published that it should make available to anyone who's paying attention to it, what those changes are. We mark that we're paying attention to it, that we care by inside the game view here is marked a state object, which means that as this thing changes, we know that the view should change as well. And that's how all the pieces are connected between our view, our view model, and our model. The view owns all of the views here and owns a state object view model. The view model is marked as observable object, it's a class, and it marks the model as published. And then the model is just a Swift structure here that owns the core business logic about how the application uh, should be should operate as the user interacts with it, what the logic should be, how how the business should change. So that's what we covered here in this section, uh, in this session that we went over. What we're going to pick up next time is figuring out how can we be adding in some the last bit of our application. So clicking on this takes us to some final screen and ends the game, and we can restart it and get some information about how we did and all those other nice features, that'd be good to see in a fully featured quiz application. So uh, that's what we're gonna cover here for today. That's what we're gonna cover in for next week. Thanks everyone who tuned in live for this one, uh, or if you were able to catch up and watch the video later on. Uh, if you have any questions more for us, we'll be back here next week. Uh, and you can also feel free to reach out to us on the Codecademy Discord or on the uh, Codecademy forums. So it was a pleasure getting to build some more applications with all of you here. Uh, and then we will see all of you here next week for what I believe will be the last session in our iOS quiz app development.